Dragons pace boy Neil McDonald cleared up here, but Mirror was not to be denied for long. From Kevin Brock's corner, first Andy Thorne had a go, then Kevin Scott. But it was Mirror whose sharp reactions were quick enough to steer the ball home. 19 minutes gone, Newcastle had the start they needed, and Mirror was in the mood to run rings around everyone. The same could hardly be said for Everton. With two cup finals there aimed, they were hardly straining up the leash. This weak effort by Graham Sharp was a rare chance. Kevin Scott has to be one of Newcastle's real successes. Here he comes storming forward and sets Frank Pingle one-on-one -on -one with Neville Southall, but the Welsh international takes some beating. Mirror was still looking lively though. He's away from the defence again, and how Pingle didn't make this number two, even the big Dane must still be working out. In the second half, Pingle was at it again. You can't fault Big Frank for effort, and this brave solo was only a foot or two away from hitting the highest notes. Everton's best chance emerged through the snowstorm, but Stuart McCall got the angles wrong, and Everton were about to be frozen out. It was that willing worker, John Hendry, who provided the telling cross for one of Newcastle's more unsung heroes. Liam O'Brien it was who turned immaculately and smashed the ball home with real venom. O'Brien deserved his reward and the general relief was understandable. Newcastle could have extended their lead even further and helped their dreadful goal difference. But John Hendry couldn't keep his shot down from this opening. Finally, Merendini reminded everybody of his passing ability splitting the defence here. But Hendry drifted just a little too wide to give himself any real chance with the shot. But by then, Newcastle were home and dry for their first home win in nearly four months. Knowing they need a spectacular improvement on their September performance against City. Then Dale Gordon broke clear to beat Dave Bethant for the first goal, despite Andy Thorne's valiant attempts to clear off the line. And the Newcastle defence was AWOL again when Robert Fleck took his turn. Pilfering points from the Canaries, who played as if they'd recently run out of trill. It also happened to be one of Mirandinha's good days. His performance and 10th goal of the season personified the unpredictable nature of the occasion. Well, having learnt the Portuguese for pass it, Jim Smith has hammered the point home to his enigmatic Brazilian star, who was cleverly involved in the build-up to Liam O'Brien's clincher. His second of the week, 2-0, Newcastle. But first, the stars of the 70s turned back the years in a special Tyneweir derby match. Morton was still at play school when some of these Newcastle old boys first pulled on a black and white shirt. Mind you, grey had now become the most popular colour, as once again the old enemy Sunderland had to be faced. But you don't lose a gift, as Tony Green reminded everyone. Stuart Barraclough had just stepped out of a time capsule, streaking away like some young apprentice before giving Jim Montgomery no chance. Not every general could last a full campaign, but Monty still relished the battle. That was Pop Robson denied. Then the double save specialist was too good for Tony Green. Sunderland showed no sense of respect and scored twice, but Dave Hilly set up Robson to make sure old rivalries could rest in peace. Then clear the stage for the great man, Kevin Keegan, Newcastle's most famous signing ever, stepped out for an encore that's taken five years to prompt. An all for one of the lads in the chorus, Kenny Wharton, for ten years a supporting actor who's helped the stars deliver their lines. Top of the bill names like Paul Gascoigne were determined to put on a show. London audiences like Spurs have always wanted someone a bit flash. But the lads in provincial rep like Gary Pallister know a step or two. He swept forward to find Paul Walsh, then carried on his search for fame, getting on the end of the cross, but leaving Chris Waddle to take the final applause. But Newcastle wanted to share in the entertainment too. A touch of farce, a Peter Shilton header, then drama by Frank Bingle. Level at half-time, but had it all made up, Kevin yearned for the spotlights again. I don't miss it, but uh, obviously I've got a lot of great memories of this place. Something very special to me, end of my career here. And uh, I'm enjoying it thoroughly, but no, it was my decision to quit. Uh, you can't go on forever. Uh, I wish I'd have trained a bit harder for this. I'm, uh, I don't know where I'm breathing from, but it's certainly not through my mouth. <laughs> second half and Mirandini is well out of order, nutmegging special K and the referee was worse, a foul by Keegan. Then a run and perfect pass from Gary Pallister and Chris Waddle was off like Ben Johnson on the Magic Pills. I don't think he even noticed Tommy Wright and he couldn't resist signing off with a flourish. 15 minutes left and Super Kev decided enough was enough, apart from a farewell swipe at United. This club should be buying players like Gascoigne and Beardsley, not selling them. 
If you sell pl class players like that, you can't keep producing them from out the bushes, you know. Great areas it is for looking for talent and that. And maybe great scouting system you have. Great players don't come along very often. They've been very privileged here. They've had four or five in the last five years, but they've sold them all. You've got a nice stand, but it's no, this won't look very good in the third division, will it? Let's hope, hope he doesn't go to that, for God's sake. No, but I'm saying, you know, stands don't win football matches. They don't score goals and they don't pull people in. It just means that when you've got a team good enough to pull them in, it's nice to put them in something like this. But you, you can't neglect your team. I don't want them to go in the second division. I know how hard we worked to get them into the first. And I, if the lads think it's hard to stay in the first division, then they're going to be in for a shock next year if they go down to see how hard it is to get out the second. It's tough. And it might not come to that if Mirandinha can keep his goal-scoring touch and complete Kenny Walton's testimonial season. Newcastle got to stay in the first division. I think the, by the way the supporters turned out tonight, 21,000. I mean, that proves that they've got to be first division. There's not many clubs in the first division will get that. I look at them tonight and they've got some very useful players out there. And the fans have got to be patient with, with the players and give them a chance to go out there and keep them in the first division. Having done that, next year's another year, you know, it could be... They could just as easily be in top six next year as bottom six, because the first division is very little difference between the top, you know, take away Liverpool's and the Everton's maybe, uh, and the Arsenal's. I mean, if you're telling me Newcastle aren't as good as Wimbledon, well, I'll eat my hat, you know. There can't be that much difference. Kevin. Footballing talent was on display at St James's Park last night. Almost 21,000 fans braved icy weather to pay tribute to Newcastle's Kenny Wharton. And thanks to the attendance, Kenny, who's been with Newcastle all his 10-year career, will make thousands of pounds from his testimonial year. It was a great night for memories, as Steve Sutton reports. For those who can remember the past glories of Northeast football, last night was a real trip down memory lane. First out, Sunderland's cup-winning side of 1973 against a Newcastle team containing many of their 1974 cup-losing side. For the record, Sunderland won 3-2, but nobody was really counting. Nostalgia and a few laughs were the name of the game. The real business of the night was a Starfield match marking the return to St James's, albeit for just one game, of Kevin Keegan, who ended his career at Newcastle five years ago. They gathered to pay tribute to this player, Kenny Wharton, a loyal servant at Newcastle for the last ten years. And make no mistake, testimonial or not, this was a game played with a true competitive edge. Old boy Chris Waddle opened the scoring. Newcastle, fielding almost a full-strength side, saw it as a useful workout. Danish striker Frank Pingle, short of league goals, would welcome a few more of these in the final few games of the season. Waddle and the other Newcastle star sold, Paul Gascoigne, turned in a dazzling display, as if to emphasise just what Newcastle was now missing. So, 1-1 at half-time, and a chance for a quick word with Kevin Keegan. You wouldn't have turned out for just anybody, Kevin. So how special a player do you think Kenny is? He's very special. I think it, it, he's, he's, he's Newcastle through and through. Um, I played with him two years here. I know what he's like as a character, and that's why I came back. Uh, I don't play in these much anymore because there's no sense. I mean, I'm 38 years of age now, and you know I should know better at my age. Into the second half, and it was Middlesbrough's Gary Pallister who put Waddle clean through to get his second. Not to be outdone, Mirandinha brought it level again soon afterwards. It may have been a friendly, but the 21,000 fans and the Brazilian certainly enjoyed that one. And at the end of it all, a thoroughly happy and slightly emotional Kenny Water. It's 21,000 almost on what, in fairness, was a very cold night. How honoured are you at that? Well, it was perishing. I mean, it took us a while to get going, to be honest with you. It was freezing. So, I mean, 21,000. I mean, any, uh, any first division club in the country would be proud of that for a first division uh, match. So, I mean, I, I'm on the moon and I, I'm really like to thank the supporters who did turn up. Was it uh, an emotional occasion out there? It was, I must admit. There was a few tears coming off at the end. I mean, it's, uh, it's great to be appreciated by you know, the, the supporters itself, and especially we being homegrown. But there was a few tears at the end. Well done, Kenny Wharton.
United had other ideas. On paper, it should have been no contest. Newcastle managerless and in disarray. Middlesbrough in form and highly organised. United, though, seemed inspired by the occasion, and Michael O'Neill so nearly gave them an early lead. Gary Pallister's cultured defensive play has won him international recognition. That didn't impress United striker John Hendry, who beat him before unleashing a shot that was too hot for players to handle. Bruce Rieck's young side controlled much of the first half, but possession counts for nothing without penetration. Dave Besson catches these in his sleep. Newcastle's breakthrough on the half hour came courtesy of an astonishing piece of misjudgment by Pallister. The header was perfectly placed into his own net. Minutes later, Borough should have levelled. Pallister headed the right way this time, and Bernie Slaven missed when it must have been easier to score. On the stroke of half-time, the visitors attacked again, but Stuart Ripley's shot on the turn from Burke's cross was just wide. Pallister and co. still had 45 minutes to put the record straight, but ominously for Middlesbrough, the boy from Brazil was beginning to find his rhythm. Neither Mowbray nor Cooper could lay leather on Mirandinha here, and he was clearly in the mood to attempt the unexpected. Seven minutes after the restart came Mirror's first magic moment, a stunning 20-yarder from O'Neill's short free kick. Newcastle, unbelievably, were two up. It surely wouldn't last. After all, Middlesbrough had won their last three league games, but another glaring miss, this time by a substitute Alan Kernahan, showed this wasn't to be their night. Newcastle, though, continued to keep Stephen Pears busy, as when Palliser and Parkinson failed to clear, and the impressive Hendry brought the best out of Borough's keeper. Pears was in action again soon after, but this time he couldn't keep the ball out. Mirandinha's pace left Mowbray and Pallas to the dead. Pears blocked, but Mirror was up like a flash to poke home the rebound. 3-0, and Newcastle had rediscovered their lost Geordie pride. Pallas had tried to make amends with his hopeful effort three minutes put in time, but there was no way past Pleasant. The final scoreline surprised even the caretaker. It did the way we finished, 3-0. But we had a feeling, and I had a feeling this afternoon, that we would get some hit today. And uh, simply because of the boys have been working quite well in training. And then you think, Middlesbrough on a high, but there's, their young boys have never been here before. And you always think, well, that's a big thing for the guy who plays St James's in the derby. We played uh, non-effective football. I mean, we haven't been positive enough in the game. Uh, we, I can recount possibly, possibly three chances. Uh, one for Dawn Slade and one for Kernigan when he came on. And a half chance for Ripley. And when you sum, when the sum total at the end of 90 minutes is are those chances, uh, and it's a few chances, then you're not likely to win that many games. Brilliant. As for Newcastle's two-goal hero, his message through faithful interpreter Jimmy Wallace was keep your feet on the ground. He says yes to work. Good goals, and people might think they were brilliant because they came at the right time during the game as well. And um, he just hopes that we don't get carried away with it and continue working.